Jay-Z and this is Tiny Temper. <laughs> and we're going to talk to you a little bit about Tone of Voice on Twitter. Um, I'm David. I'm a writer. Um, my background is in TV and uh, online and magazines, where my journalistic achievements uh, include coming up with the nickname Justin Trouser Snake and uh, once having Kerry Katona's tongue in my ear. <clears throat> but now, uh, I tweet for a living. Um, I help brands and TV shows and radio uh, define their tone of voice on Twitter um, and help them come up with sort of creative ways of growing their following. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about why tone of voice is important and uh, how I ended up tweeting for a job. Um, it all started for me on the night of the London riots when uh, I wasn't much of a tweeter, but was just following the events on there like everybody else. And one of the things that people were tweeting about was the rumor that a pub called The Dolphin was uh, burning down. Um, if you haven't been to The Dolphin or you don't know it, it's sort of kind of like the Cavos of East London. Um, it's the place you go when everywhere else is shut and um, rave to club classics and R&B until uh, five in the morning. Um, and having just moved across the road from this classy establishment, um, I tweeted saying, oh, no, it's fine. I can see it's fine. And people were replying saying things like, you know, thank God for that. It's the only pub I'd ever had sex in. Uh, and um, all kinds of sort of filth um, that was very amusing. Um, and I couldn't believe that the Dolphin didn't have its own Twitter account. So I decided to set one up. It's real highbrow stuff. Um, it wasn't something that I had planned to, to live on beyond a couple of days. But by the following morning, it had over 1,000 followers. Um, and people seemed to be really enjoying talking to it. So I decided to uh, keep it going. <laughs> and um, soon, it started making a few um, famous friends, like <laughs> Caitlin Moran, uh, and people like Grace then, who were very nice about it. Rizzle kicks and I won't go on. But um, then, yeah, a few, fast forward a few months and the dolphin was dipping its fins into matters outside of the pub, um, such as the Olympics, when much to my surprise and uh, excitement, the following tweet about an athlete called Katrina Johnson-Thompson went on to be one of the um, top tweets of Super Saturday, despite the uh, amazing things that were going on there. Um, and that was exciting enough, but then got all the more exciting when uh, a couple of days later, she'd obviously got wind of it and um, tweeted a response of uh, step one. So I'm responsible for that love. Um, and then the dolphin has also punched above its weight and been among the top tweets for a number of other things, such as the fantastic TV experience that was Drugs Live. <laughs> and uh, has since gone on to uh, time out, named it its favorite London tweeter and a few other things. But to cut a long story short, um, it's gone from being something that I set up for a bit of a laugh to something that has changed my career. Um, and it's had a big impact on the pub itself, who um, say they get a lot of people coming in every week who um, are there because they've been following the tweets. Um, and I guess the key reasons for for it uh, was two really. One, trying new things, kind of coming up with creative ways of using Twitter, and a second one is tone of voice. So from the outset, I've been really clear about the type of people that uh, I'm that are following, and I've made a point of tweeting as one of them. And I guess that's what is really key to a lot of this, which is that tweeters really want personality. Um, so on the back of some of the Dolphins' achievements, uh, I started getting asked to tweet for other people which was very exciting, and for cash, which was even more exciting. Um, so I started tweeting for people like Adidas and Money Supermarket and um, Polydor Records and BBC One's The Voice. Um, when I took over uh, The Voice's account, quite a lot of um, sort of entertainment TV shows had quite stale uh, social media, had quite stale Twitter accounts. 
um, often just pointing to links on iPlayer or Channel 4 or something and uh, reminding people to tune in. But by putting a bit of love and care and attention into a tone of voice, um, we managed to sort of break a few BBC records in terms of um, uh, followers and engagement for a first series, and we made a few headlines. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the voice managed to beat um, Britain's Got Talent, the big juggernaut that is the Simon Cowell machine. And then uh, I also sent a few tweets to Simon Cowell's mate, Sunita, inviting her to come and uh, hang out with Danny O'Donoghue, which apparently left him raged, said the uh, Daily Star, which can only ever be a good thing. Um, another thing that's really key to success on Twitter is being able to enter a conversation that lots of people are having and putting your own spin on it, um, which is something that sounds really obvious and really easy, but it's something that actually quite a lot of brands, most brands, I think, are, are getting wrong, obviously not the ones that we've seen before. But um, So these are a couple of examples. Um, when Andy Murray lost in the final of the Australian Open. These are both mine. So, sort of a couple of different. Um, so, one was uh, rewriting some Jesse J lyrics uh, to you to shoehorn in Andy Murray, um, which went down well with her fans. And then a slightly less successful approach, uh, slightly more lazy on Money Supermarket, where I chose just to tweet epic that got the massive one retweet. So, um, we can all take something from that, I think. Um, and something else I like to do on Twitter is. Um, use sort of recurring features and themes, kind of like in magazines, um, that give your followers a reason to keep coming back to your feed and that sets your feed aside from other ones, which I think is really important. Um, and there's a few sort of examples of this. So one is star signs, which is normally just me taking star signs off the sun horoscopes or something and dolphinifying them, which is normally just adding a swear word uh, or something to do with 90s R&B. Um, and then every Friday, I like to give, uh, thanks, thanks. Um, I like to give my followers um, a little Friday treat to sort of get that Friday feeling going, um, which is sort of all ended with uh, fuck it, it's Friday. Um, you know, obviously sometimes dipping into the sort of zeitgeisty uh, burger scandal. Um, but one thing I've found particular success with um, on the feeds that I look after is quizzes. Um, tweeters seem to really love a quiz. So the ones that I do, it's really simple. Just tweet a few questions, and it's the first person to tweet back um, with all the right answers and the hashtag in one tweet wins the prize, um, which for the dolphin is normally sort of a pint and a Twix. Um, but depending on who you're tweeting for, it can be something different. Um, again, it's real classy stuff. <laughs> but. Thank you. The ones that I've done, so the voice is uh, one we've done a couple of times, and that's trended worldwide both times. Uh, the dolphins one is the first time I got the dolphin trending, which, considering what the dolphin is, was very amusing to me, and even more exciting by the fact that it was trending one place higher than the Nobel Peace Prize, um, which tells you a lot about people on Twitter. Um, but one other thing that um, is a real easy way to sort of grow your followers um, and attract a lot of attention quite quickly on Twitter is by having the right type of conversation with the right people in the right way at the right time. We saw O2 as an example, a really good example. They've had a few of them. Um, but I've had a few that have done quite well. One was a conversation with a jar of coffee, um, which to, is basically just a load of bollocks. Um, but I tweeted something about Derek, but they saw it and very bravely uh, decided to reply. and. Um, we sort of went into a long, quite surreal conversation that got loads of retweets, loads of shares, and popped up in loads of blogs and in papers and stuff. Um, and it, people seemed quite interested to see how an individual or a character interacted with a brand. And again, like we've seen with O2 and with Paddy Power, um, they, they were very brave to do it, um, but they handled it brilliantly. I think they pretty much doubled their followers and um, attracted a lot of attention. And got, um, so this guy, Neil Mann, who some of you might follow, who's now at the Wall Street Journal, called it possibly the greatest ever Twitter conversation. Could have left out the possibly. Um, and then since then, I've gone on to have a few more of these pointless but quite well-shared conversations, such as one with the kebab shop Mangal. And if you're not following Mangal, I uh, urge you. Mangal 2, one of my favorite things on Twitter. Um, and this ended up just being 
uh, a bit of a sort of playground uh, slang in match. Um, but again, lots of people were talking about it. We both jumped lots of followers, um, and it attracted lots of attention. And spawned wall blog to call it possibly the second greatest <laughs> ever Twitter conversation. So uh, that was very exciting. Since then, um, I more recently had a similar conversation with Innocent Smoothies, who are brilliant on Twitter. Um, and again, it all sort of spiraled out of me tweeting something about being hung like an innocent veg pot or something. They came in, and we had a long conversation that, um, again, got lots of retweets, lots of shares, popped up, I think, in Metro. Um, and uh, yeah, it was very brave of them, and uh, showed that they're not so innocent. You see. Thanks. Um, so the yeah, only other thing I was going to mention was the fact that I'm um, about to take over the Twitter for The Apprentice, this series. So feel free to start tweeting me all your insults about Lord Sugar. Um, we're going to try something a bit different. So the premise being that The Apprentice is all about power, um, and uh, knowledge is power. So the Twitter feed um, on the night of the show is just going to be all about dropping knowledge. So dropping facts about um, the candidates and the um, Lord Sugar and the, th the challenges that they're having to do. And sometimes they may add a slightly different dimension to what you're seeing on screen. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Cheers. Hi guys, um, very rare you get the opportunity to follow Jay-Z and precede Gary Lineker, um, so that's great for me. Some might say it's a bit of a shit sandwich, but um, I'll, do, I'll do my <laughs> utmost. So um, <clears throat> I'm here to talk about uh, tone of voice on Twitter. So see David, Jay-Z, call him what you will, is you know, hilariously taking you through uh, how he has used Twitter professionally and personally, um, using different voices, different personalities, but equally as compelling. I want to talk uh, to you guys about how brands can do it as well and what we're seeing as well. So um, what, we're trying to, what we've seen in the last few years, 10, 20 years of the advent of the internet is that what was once conversations tend to be very monologue or you know, controlled by, let's say, journalists or TV presenters, with the advent of the internet and, say, Twitter recently, the conversation has become massive and it's exploded. So many more people have a voice and it's become much more interesting to many people. So how do you succeed in this space? 20 years ago, people typically were very, very formal, but we don't really see that so much now. So sorry to oversimplify, but just to make it as easy as possible, we've created two labels, real talk and work talk. So with real talk, it's how you chat to your mates, what you're chatting to in the pub, etc., etc. Work talk, it's how you potentially would, you know, uh, talk, how, you know, does anyone's mother here have a phone voice, for example, right? So, you know, or, you know, how would you talk to your mother-in-law, uh, mother or how would you write a letter? That's what work talk is. So I'm going to ask a couple of, you know, questions and see how you kind of get along with that. So, is this real talk or work talk? Please do not hesitate to get back to me. Work talk, exactly. What about this? Give me a bell. Real talk, work talk. Real talk, exactly. This is something you more like to say to your friends, a bit more endearing, builds trust, a liking, maybe, you know. And this is what we're seeing really, really works, not only with people, but also with brands. Finally, at your earliest convenience, who in, on earth would use this uh, if they wanted to endear themselves to anyone? It's the kind of thing you might write to, you know, your lawyer or, you know, or your doctor might write to you if you had some kind of rare disease. Now look, so I think what's really important to say is not to say there's no space in the world for work talk anymore, it's just that when you, know, you use real talk, it seems more genuine, more informal, and actually it's gaining more and more traction and power. So it's kind of less of a role for work talk. Before I talk about brands, I'm gonna talk about people that are winning in this space uh, today. Now, in music, Rihanna epitomizes real talk. She, you know, seemingly just talks for herself, says what she wants. She's amongst the most followed on Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and we've really put that down to tone of voice. But actually, if you follow her on Instagram, she's followed probably for different reasons, if you've seen the photos. So, let's have a couple of examples here. 
This gentleman, I believe, Chris Pack ASAP Shakur, writes, mm, Rihanna, do you know your boobs are hanging out in like all of your videos? To which she replies, you're welcome. <laughs> Fine. Next, Mr. Fish E. Poomps writes, only females who are deprived of talent need to sell their art with sex and, and soft porn. Right, Rihanna? To which she replies, whatever you say, fishy poom poom. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, Drew Prosser writes, wow, as I look through, uh, and I apologise for profanity, as I look through Rihanna's timeline, I realise how unclassy she actually is. I see, uh, I, I see a lot of C's and F's, to which she replies, F-U-C. <laughs> so, <clears throat> 20 years ago, this would have been headline news for all the wrong reasons. She would have been ostracised, alienated, etc. But it gets her more fans, and it's because she's genuine. Yes, it is funny, but she's genuine. But that, you know, cynics could say, that's music, it's cutting edge, it's edgy. They've got to be a bit like that. But what about politics? <laughs> Even our esteemed Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, Exitonian, uh, Bullingdon Club member, uh, he's embracing real talk. Uh, how do we know this? Well, if everyone remembers Phone Hacking Gate, which came out, uh, there are a load of articles around it, uh, to which a lot of, uh, uh, all of his texts to Rebecca Brooks were published verbatim. One of the most newsworthy bits picked up by the press was the fact that he got the meaning of lol wrong. He thought it was lots of love rather than laugh out loud, and Brooks had to correct him. Right, as you can imagine, this spawned millions of chortles on Twitter, and they created hashtag David Cameron text speak. Some of the best being LMAO, <laughs> let me ask Osborne, <laughs> IMHO, is my horse outside? <laughs> and my personal favourite, which I wasn't allowed to use because Bruce told me not to, but sod it, was BTW, bollocks to Wales. So <clears throat> I think um, what's important here is that look, this is just an organic conversation, but in the day that article came out, he got, this hashtag got one and a half thousand references, just with jokes and playfulness like that, and it was fantastic. However, that was... Uh, an accident. He got long, lol wrong by accident, however he did try. What if, what if politicians use uh, real talk deliberately? Well, the results can be fantastic. So, the Labour press team last year said, tweeted this, send out a surge party. We haven't seen the Lib, the Lib Dems haven't tweeted since mid-July. To which the Lib Dems replied, oh yeah, sorry, we've been running the country. <laughs> Hashtag coalitious. Don't know what that means. The response from Labour, though, equally is electric. Oh, well, that's going well. Keep up with the good work. <laughs> <coughs> Pardon me. So I think what's, you know, fantastic to note here is that this is playful. This is like banter. 20 years ago, uh, when I was a kid, 30 years ago, when I was a kid, uh, party politics was combative, antagonistic. You'd watch the Houses of Parliament full of old men, so formal, it seemed like they're talking in Latin. So, I mean, it was very, very difficult. Fast forward today, this is the kind of stuff that goes on. And it's interesting to note, the week after they tweeted this little kind of battle, their following grew more than for the rest, of, you know, on that particular thing than any other period of that year. So it has impact. But that's a political party. Can anyone guess, I think, who personalises real talk or this kind of genuine or informal as a politician in, uh, more than anyone else? Any guesses? Well, let's have a look at this video, maybe you'll see. He flies through the air with the greatest of ears, a daring young man on the flying frappies. His movements were graceful for girls he could please, and my love... A sticky end was the mot juste for Johnson's celebrated trip, which climaxed with the daring young mayor stuck on the zip wire. I want you to know, this game way is very, very well organised. <laughs> Get me a ladder. <laughs> I want you to know that that was far more painful and frightening than you might think. If any other politician anywhere in the world got stuck on a zip wire, it would be, you know, Disastrous for Boris, it'll be an absolute triumph. Uh, there's no um, he, um, 
He defies, he defies all forms of gravity. And what Cameron was, you know, going on to say is that, look, Boris is the only one who can get away with that, and he's absolutely right. Why? Why, does getting, why can he get stuck on a zip wire and Douglas Hurd can't, for example? Now, it's because he's genuine, he's fallible, you know. We know he makes errors and we love him for it. But my best part, my favourite part of that clip is actually when he's laughing at himself doing it. Um, another incident uh, in the first video is that, you know, the most tweeted thing was about him, his dance at the Olympics. Now, I'm pretty sure, having spoken to, you know, Helen and our press team, any media training would say to politicians, do not dance you know, when you're on camera. But he did it, he looked ridiculous, but people loved it, and he's much loved for it. So, what makes a good tweet? Well, Carnegie Mellon University did a lot of research around this, and you know, what they did is they got 1,500 users, um, and they, uh, those 1,500 users analyzed 43,000 tweets across 21,000 different tweeters. Now, they then had to categorize those tweets into what was worthy of reading, not worthy of reading, or neutral. And what made a good tweet is when they involved other people, it's a very inclusive, when they questioned people, David was talking about some of his most successful tweets, are his dolphin uh, uh, you know, quizzes, stuff he does on The Voice when he asks things, exactly the same here, and also sharing information uh, and links. What made a bad tweet was when it was all about me.com, worthless to anyone else. Or public conversations, which are very private in nature, so no one really cared. And don't be mean. People don't like it when, when people are mean. One of the biggest myths that came out of this, though, is that only the funniest survive. So Skittles, you know, are really, really funny, but it's not just about being funny. And I know as brands, that's one of the things people think, oh, we have to be funny, we have to be funny. Not actually true. What the chart showed was actually being informative is more valuable. 50% of those who uh, were, uh, were uh, surveyed in this said that being informative was the thing they found most worthy and in second place was funny. So we'll show you some examples. Innocent, very, very cute here. They're just talking about the clock's going forward. This is the other week. It's got nothing to do with uh, smoothies, juices, nat you know, and, uh, you know, natural ingredients, etc. It's just trying to be helpful. But they're very cute about it, using their fonts and their style, and it got you know close to a thousand retweets. One of the things that came out massively for tweets that were considered not worthy of reading is do not be boring. 82% of those surveyed said boring tweets are rubbish, okay? And they, you know, don't be boring. So, this is the most boring tweet in the world. T's and C's on a tweet. I'm gonna find someone here, I like Tim Lindley. Tim, uh, uh, heads up digital at Red Bull, one of the best in this area. Tim, do you like reading T's and C's? Right, exactly. Take it from him, not me. You might not have heard him, he said no. Right, so I think that, and people don't think they want to go to Twitter to read T's and C's. So, a lot of people are that, uh, guilty of this, but, you know, um, be careful with that, I think. Secondly, checking in, pretty dull, okay? This is what the research said, it's not what necessarily we're saying, but it's what the research said, and what we mean by this is that, you know, we are very much, there's a there's a low myriad of information out there that, you know, we're spoilt with information. So we've been trained to ask so what about everything. We're, you know, our brains just ask so what all the time. So if you're given information, it's got to be of interest, it's got to be worthy. Unless this has some value, it's not worthy of anyone. Me telling people that I'm at Heathrow Airport has no use to anyone. My family already know, um, hopefully, and, you know, and anyone else I want to know know. The only person this might have value to is, say, a burglar. You know, so it's not really valuable to anyone. So, <clears throat> oh yeah, and everyone thinks he's a lovable brummy, um, and in many ways he is, uh, but he would sack me. He's pretty cold like that. So I think, you know, and actually there's a Metrolink diary, which is a, uh, a real-time Californian uh, 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 Twitter stream that tells people about travel in their area. Um, they said that check-ins were like Twitter masturbation. You might like doing it, but no one, everyone else would rather not know. So I think that, you know, it's important to keep that in mind. So what we try to do is create an easy one-slide guide for brands to think, how can you succeed? How can your tweet succeed? So we thought that these are the key categories. If you, can, if you want to have fun, 
you want to help, or if you want to inform. And if you choose two of those, you're then really, really successful typically. After hours of high-fiving and whooping around the office thinking we're total geniuses, we actually realise quite a few people have made this assertion before. Actually, recently, most notably Sue Uniman, the uh, uh, Chief Strategy Officer of Media Commerce, wrote a book called Tell the Truth about how brands can most effectively market their message and what they're trying to get out there. And what her categories are, entertain, offer value, and tell the truth. So very much a symbiosis there, a synergy there. So just to wrap up, I'm just going to show a few examples of how you know, people have done this incredibly well. The first one is this lady, Laura Ellen, basically wrote, can, I, can you tell I like chocolate? I'd like, I tell I like chocolate a bit too much when I'm following both Kit Kat and Oreo. Okay, pretty bland. She just put that out there. Kit Kat responds, the fight for Laura's affections is on. Oreo, your move. They create a noughts and crosses board. This is pretty, you know, quickly capitalizing on the shape of Kit Kat and Oreo. Okay, fantastic. Oreo's response is as follows. Uh, sorry, Kit Kat, we couldn't resist. Showing them an eaten, you know, Kit Kat. Now, what's fantastic about this is they could have gone on with the game, but it's a mutual appreciation of the brands, and again, helped them grow their following. So, you know, it was really, really powerful for that, and again, this caused great PR for them. Second example here, you know, we've talked about this a lot, are innocent drinks. <coughs> here they're offering value here, they're trying to help. They're saying, if you get two hula hoops and drop them in a mug of coffee, you've got yourself an owl. <laughs> a superb owl, to hark back to Ollie Snoddy. So, believe you me, there are, more, there are some of the more simple people in our office still believe that is an owl hiding in a mug. <laughs> if anyone wants to know afterwards who it is, I'm happy to tell you. So, that's another way, just a fun thing. Again, it gets a huge amount of retweets. And finally, HTC. HTC are an esteemed technology brand. They don't want to make jokes or have lols. So what they're trying to do, again, is offer a bit of value to the people who follow them. And what they've started doing is every Friday is they give, they capitalize, they know that, that people what like movies on Twitter. So they basically start offering uh, tickets to go and see movies. They put these tweets out and within half an hour, they got 1,000 retweets, and their following grew. What that does is, yes, that engenders you know, great warmth and help, and again, this real talk, but it increases their following and gives them almost permission to talk to these followers about their new product services, as well as the offers. So look, there are loads of brands winning in this space. That's just a few examples. Um, but we hope that you know, by chatting about tone of voice, we can see that how you can make your brand uh, really succeed by using real talk. Thank you so much for your time today.